cliffside villages, towering castles, picturesque towns, a beautiful city, charming people. This place has it all. Portugal at Europe's most western edge, the Iberian Peninsula. Come with us to know the land and its people. At around 300 BC, the Celtic tribes from the north started to settle in the Iberian Peninsula, including northern parts of Portugal and Spain. They are also called Lusitanians, with a strong genetic and cultural ties with the people of Galicia, Ireland, and the Basque Country. When the Roman Empire in 117 AD invaded vast territories, including the Iberian Peninsula, the Lusitanians, with their legendary leader Viriatus, fought to the death. The Romans, however, prevailed. The Roman conquerors embraced Christianity in 313 AD and brought Catholicism to Lusitania, now modern-day Portugal, and remained as such even after the Roman Empire's decline, starting in 409 AD. They ruled Portugal for 300 years. In 429 AD, the Suebi, like the Visigoths, from Central Europe in the area near present-day Czech Republic, invaded and occupied Portugal for 250 years. Then came the North African Moors, bearing the banners of Islam and renamed the region Al-Andalus. The Emirate of Cordoba reinforced the conquest under Islam in 756 AD. Islamic rule in Portugal lasted more than 500 years. With renewed strength under the banner of Christianity, the kingdoms of Galicia, Leon and Castile, and other kingdoms drove down the Islamic Tafia states out of Europe in 1018 AD. In 1249 AD, Portugal was freed from the Islamic grip. Portugal's peace and independence, however, was always under threat from the incessant invasion of neighbor Spain. Countless battles were fought, so many lives were lost. So Portugal allied itself with a stronger brother, England. In 1386, with the signing of the Treaty of Windsor, Portugal's stability was reinforced. With renewed power and finances, Portugal went for the seas and a new age of exploration began. Enter the Portuguese Masters of the Seas. In 1488 AD, Bartolomeu Dias circumnavigated the Cape of Good Hope at the tip of South Africa, also establishing trade with West Africa like modern-day Angola. In 1494, the Treaty of Tordesillas established a line across the globe, giving exploration rights to Portugal to the east of the line and to Spain to the west of it. In 1497, Vasco da Gama crossed the Indian Ocean and established a trade route with India. In the year 1500 AD, Pedro Álvaro Cabral established the Portuguese colony in Brazil. After traveling 7,470 kilometers, Portuguese remains the dominant language in Brazil. In 1521, Ferdinand Magellan although a Portuguese discovered the Philippines under the banner of Spain. In 1543 AD, Antonio Mota and other sailors landed in Japan and the southern coasts of China, including Macau and Formosa, the modern-day Taiwan, later in 1544. The journey would take years to accomplish. Dispelling myths and unknowns, Portugal has opened the doors of trade to the world. The great earthquake 
in 1755 has devastated Portugal, with Portugal still rebuilding from its ruins the Spanish-Portuguese War between 1762 and 1763 continues. Despite this, Portugal, then allied with England, won this war against Spain, then allied with France. Portuguese history called it the Fantastic War. In the First World War, Portugal again fought with allied England. In the Second World War, it remained neutral. Several monarchy leaders and politicians later, Portugal has seen no major changes in the lives of its people. Significant progress in Portugal's economy was said to have taken place after it joined the European Union. Compared to its European neighbors, Portugal is a small country of just more than 10.3 million people. The country measures 561 kilometers north to south and 218 kilometers east to west. Let us start with Fatima, Portugal, which will take two hours from capital Lisbon. This quiet town named after the 12th century Moorish princess, has been one of the greatest Marian shrines visited by thousands of pilgrims from around the world since 1917. The story goes that in May of 1917, three local children named Jacinta, Francisco, and Lucia, ages 7, 9, and 10, claimed to have encountered the Blessed Virgin Mary on their way home from tending a flock of sheep. The figure appeared again and again only to the children to reveal her messages to mankind, an event accepted by the Vatican in Rome. I felt that there is something divine in this place, more so when I see people of all ages praying and walking on their knees for penance. Our trip brings us to the town of Batalha, or Batal, a small place with 16,000 people. The Mosteiro de Batalha is a Dominican convent built to commemorate the 1385 battle against the Spanish, as promised by King John I of Portugal, ending the crisis. It took a century to build, spanning the reign of seven kings from 1386 1517. The intricate Gothic design of the monastery is reminiscent of England's Canterbury Cathedral. Here are the tombs of King John I and wife Philippa and four of their sons. In 1980, this was turned into a museum and by 1983, was added by UNESCO to its list of heritage sites. The statue is that of Nuno Álvarez Pereira, a Portuguese military general who won for Portugal the battle in 1385. This is Nazaré, a town of 16,000 people facing the Atlantic coast, a picturesque seaside village that in the recent years became known as a tourist destination but still retains its vibe as a fishing village where old meets the new. Dried salted fish and white cod called bacalao is a delicacy here. Lunch of course 
is grilled sea bass and Portuguese Atlantic sardines. Perched high up over the cliff is Sitio Nazare. You can take the funicular on the foreground or your car to reach the top. In the early days, this mountain village is a refuge and protects the people from raids by Vikings, French, and the English invaders. Today, it is a bustling tourist attraction. Nazare is known for big Atlantic waves created by Nazare's underwater canyon combined with strong ocean currents. To catch these big waves, you have to be here between October to March. We are here in February, so the waves are pretty big. If you're lucky, you may be able to see big wave surfers in action. An hour's drive from Lisbon is the medieval town of Obidos. This is a walled fortress, settled even before the arrival of the Romans. Here you will find churches, a castle inhabited by royalties in the 13th century, a maze of streets and white houses that are a delight to see. We tried the Ginja de Ovidos, a sour cherry brandy which we drank from a small chocolate cup you can chew after the shot. I couldn't miss to watch Fado a music genre officially originated in Portugal around 1820. We had dinner at this restaurant that not only served good food, but a good selection of port wine. Port wines are typically richer, sweeter, heavier, and higher in alcohol content than unfortified wines, as it is mixed with a distilled wine spirit like brandy. These wines are made from northern Portugal in the Douro region. They are versatile wines and can be paired with almost anything. Fado are sad songs that usually talks about someone's longing of an answered love which in the early days were sung by Portugal's seafaring people. It is accompanied by a guitare portuguese, much like a mandolin. The Portuguese are musical people. Their Portuguese language sounds so romantic. It is influenced by vulgar Latin spoken by the Roman soldiers, imbibed through three centuries of occupation. In 1878, 16,000 Portuguese workers in search of a better life migrated to the Hawaiian Islands to work in plantations. They brought with them their families and their musical instruments, 
like this Bragina, the origin and inspiration of the Hawaiian ukulele. Thirty kilometers from Lisbon is Sintra, a town situated within the hills of Serra de Sintra. Hidden within pine-covered hills are extravagant houses, the ruins of a Moorish castle and a beautiful palace. The history of the Park and National Palace of Pena dates back to the 12th century where a chapel and later a monastery of Our Lady of Pena stands. The Lisbon earthquake of 1755 totally destroyed it. In 1836, Queen Maria II and Ferdinand II, who was an artist, built a summer home which later became this beautiful palace displaying Manuelin and Moorish influences. In 1910, the Palace of Pena was classified as a national monument and in 1995, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Here with our local guide and driver, Zhao. Along the shores of Cascais, is the beautiful resort town of Estoril. Hotel Palacio is where James Mann's author Ian Fleming stayed during the Second World War and found as inspiration the Casino Estoril for his novel Casino Royale, the first James Mann written book in 1953. A classic film shot in the Czech Republic, Venice and Lake Como in northern Italy. Fishing is still a major source here, despite its high-end vibe. The sites in Lisbon are quite spread apart, so we took a city tour bus, see the city once around, then hop off on sites we found interesting. Torre de Belém, or the Tower of St. Vincent, was completed in 1514 to protect Lisbon from intruders, as it is heavily armed with cannons. Lisbon was the world's main trade hub in the 15th and 16th century due to its maritime discoveries of the New World. While in the area, don't miss Pastéis de Belém, a pastry shop that makes classic Portuguese egg tart since 1837. Also known as Praca Dom Pedro, Rocio Square is the liveliest square in Lisbon, with its cobblestone floor in wave pattern, outdoor cafes and a relaxed vibe. I also love the Baroque fountains on either side of the square. The buildings on the background houses our hotel with a wonderful vista of the garden. It is also near my mandatory stop in my travels, the Hard Rock Cafe Lisbon or Hard Rock Cafe Lisboa to the locals. Next stop today is the Monument to the Discoveries. Padrao dos Descobrimentos is a monument in the northern bank of the Tagus River estuary 
built in 1960 that features Portuguese exploration heroes like Dom Henrique of Portugal or Prince Henry the Navigator and other explorers like Vasco da Gama, Magellan, Cabral and others. Vasco da Gama is indeed a popular Portuguese hero. They even named a beautiful bridge after him. Crossing this bridge to the other side of Lisbon will take you to Cristo Rey, an iconic Catholic statue with arms raised blessing this city. Built in the 1950s, its construction represents Portugal's religious gratitude for avoiding the horrors of World War II where Portugal remained neutral. Campo Pequeno Stadium is the official home of Portuguese bullfighting that opens in the summer starting in July. Portuguese bullfighting is said to be less violent and has more respect for the animal than that in Spain. This Moorish-inspired structure was built for two years and finished in 1890. We're back in Rocio Square for an after-dinner evening stroll. The great 1755 Lisbon earthquake estimated between 8.5 to 9 in strength that generated tsunamis as high as 20 meters destroyed two-thirds of buildings and homes in Lisbon and killing 60,000 people. Buildings we see now are built after 1755 and is a testament to Portugal's resilience. Thanks to people like the Marques de Pombao for spearheading construction and recovery of Lisbon. As we were walking around Praca di Comercio, we were pleasantly surprised by a parade we later knew was part of Lisbon Carnival, a celebration lasting three days, culminating on Shrove Tuesday before Ash Wednesday. It was an elaborate, festive parade and street party. Tram Line 28 has become one of Lisbon's popular activity. It's like a journey back in time, over hills and medieval streets in vintage trams from 1930s that are still much part of the city's public transport. Developed in 1914, it can take you to another iconic place, the Castelo de São Jorge. Built in the mid-11th century during the Moorish period, it was not built as a residence, but to house military troops, and in case of siege, the elite housed in the citadel. The Elevador de Santa Justa was constructed in 1900 and opened in 1902. It was made of wrought iron, which in the 1900s was an art form. 
This viewing platform at the top of this lift is one of the most sought-after location in Lisbon. It has a cafe that can accommodate 29 people at a time. Our journey ends in Cabo da Roca, the wild, rugged headland that marks the westernmost point of mainland Europe. Up until the 14th century, it was believed to be the edge of the world. It almost feels like it, looking at the vast Atlantic Ocean, but the gallant Portuguese explorers has proven it wasn't so. Like dreamers, we wanted to see more of the world. I hope God wills it. <laughs>